looking at this. All right, so the notes for today should be online or are online. And so you can download them from here. And so these are the ones that we'll use today. So, so that's the first, first part. Um, and so what I plan to do today is just go through those. So, you, so you, they're in the course resources page. So all that will change is that there will be a re review 2017 video that will go up, which will be the recording of what we're doing now. So that's the, the plan. Um, I plan just to, uh, to go through this material uh, to summarize um, what we've been talking about. I, I've told, so I'll send an email uh, today or an announcement that includes a link to this uh, then video, which can't be linked now because it doesn't exist. Um, but it will also uh, give details about the three questions in the test. So you know the test is three questions, always is. It's uh, 110 points per question, 100% is a full answer, so you can boost your score by 10%, uh, I guess. Uh, you can get the top score would be 110%. Uh, it's not curved, it's an actual score. Um, there are three questions. Uh, it's a 90 minute test nominally, but you have uh, from 8 when it will begin until uh, midnight, if you so wish. And then the TAs and proctors will get tired and want to go home and kind of edge you along, I think. Um, there are three questions. Um, the topics are, uh, there's one question on viscosity and free body diagrams related to that. You can see examples of that in prior tests. A second one, and this will be in the announcement, on pressures at a point, uh, manometry, buoyancy, um, and there'll be one on fluid pressures on structures and their failure or displacement. And so, so those are the three topical areas. And so, um, what I'll do today is I'll go through a list of equations that I think would be perhaps useful to you in the first part, and then I'll go through to summarize what I think is the remainder of the the first three three weeks and one one third three and one third weeks of the class, right? Which is what we had up to four one. So it covers the material up to including four point one, which is the stuff we finished on Monday. Um, there's going to be a homework due. Uh, this Thursday. Next Thursday's homework, since it's a test on Wednesday, is due on the Sunday. And that's kind of a s standard as well. We, we put it back by three days. You can still get it done by Thursday if you so wish, uh, but, but that's the other facility, I guess, to you. Um, I don't know. I should probably stop talking about all this and actually do something. Um, hopefully, uh, scores will be much elevated over past years. Um, I'm not trying to catch you out. You can if you think I'm spinning your yarn, you can check uh, the exams from previous years, midterms from previous years with the review sessions, which are recorded, and see uh, how the veracity of my statements as to what's on the test, etc. Um, so it's not curved. The reality is, I've said this uh, at the beginning class, um, uh, the idea is to get you conversant with fluid mechanics so you don't hurt someone. You can hurt people. Uh, and, uh, you know, you're... Your solemn charge as, a, as an engineer to be is to ensure public safety and well-being. And so curving things means that you know, the class could be a horrible class. No one could know anything, but because you're better than everyone else, you get an A. But the, the good news that comes out of it, it may be bad news or appear to be bad news that it's not curved. The good news is that I think this class probably has a large, much larger proportion of A's than any usual class that is curved. And it's because it's kind of a, a bimodal distribution. Uh, and so you just need to make sure you're in the you're in the front mode, the front hump of the camel. And so uh, yeah, so that's it. Okay. Any questions before I spill the beans? Yeah. All right. Um, what do I want to do? I'll do it on a tall page. So I will do this, and I will do this, and I will do. All right. So, I told you what the components would be. So, um, 
So I guess my point would be that if you know the expressions that we'll talk about on this first page, you probably have enough to be able to do the test. Of course, you need to know how to use them. And so uh, it's not just enough, I think, just to, to know what the expressions are. So viscosity also comes with the, the ideal gas law. So, And I did have a portion on that, but I took that out, I think. So maybe you don't need this. But you know with the ideal gas law, pressures related to temperatures in terms of absolute pressures, absolute temperatures. This is a gas constant for a particular gas. I had a discussion with Lubisha, for those of you who are also in Lubisha's class who couldn't work out exactly what the deal was here. And of course, density is equal to mass over volume. Um, and this is um, RT. And so sometimes you see this written in terms of uh, a volume. And so the expressions we're talking about are exactly the same. They're not incorrect. And maybe Lubisha uh, clarified that in the class that you have in 301. But this is the one that I always use. R is a particular gas constant for a particular gas. Uh, if it's uh, the universal gas constant, then it's rho universal gas constant temperature over the molecular mass of that particular gas. They're equivalent to what you're dealing with in. Um, in Lubitsch's class. So, that's an aside, maybe. Viscosity, Newton's law of viscosity. Shear stress is related to uh, a gradient of velocities through a coefficient, which is referred to as a dynamic viscosity, as opposed to kinematic viscosity, which we haven't uh, introduced, we don't need to. And we've done some examples. I think uh, we moved over it quite quickly, but there was an example in the notes that basically looked at the behavior of, a, of two fluids, mu1, mu2, something being pulled with some force T, which relates to um, tau multiplied by area equals T. Tau is a shear stress. And we can convert a shear stress into a force, which we often have to do by multiplying it by some area. Area would be the area of this plate. And if these are static, then in this particular case, the shear stress being applied here would be countered by, would be uniform throughout the system. So in this case, the shear stress all the way through this, which is causing this uh, behavior, is this. And this is predicated on the idea that in this particular case, I guess, the velocity profile would look like this. This would be the velocity in the x direction. This is delta y, and so those two terms together give you some way to be able to calculate what the shear stress is that's applied on this plate. And so, that's. so all of these would require you to use Newton's law of viscosity, which is what that is, but it would apply you to figure out what the, the, the resolution of forces are on your free body. I mean, that's the, the trick in all of these. There's some in past years. There's one for rotating column, there's one for uh, a mass slipping through a, um, a tight pipe with viscous effects. Basically your assumption has to be that the velocity gradient across this has to be the typical velocity. And, and you've done some examples like this. Okay. So you have to, um, to, to, to do the free body diagram. So this is part of the story. The other part of the story is you've got to figure out exactly what the, the forces are that are acting on the system. Questions? So fluid pressures. What do we know? Well, we went through um, 
a derivation, but there were two key expressions that came out. First of all, you'll recall that we chose this coordinate system. And whatever we did, we ended up with two important expressions. Changes in pressure with elevation are equal to negative density times gravity, which is the same as the unit weight. Always true. And changes in pressure as you go horizontally. If you can get there in the same fluid, don't change. <clears throat> and so the consequence of this expression, this is always true. Um, and you may recall that we drew some figures uh, to look at pressures versus elevation. And if this is water, those figures look like this. And uh, this for air. And the consequence of this is that we always used to draw this figure that we could write um, this is dp and dz on the same level with this. So this one here would be unit weight, and this would be 1. So this, this expression is always true, always absolutely true. It may not be that um, the pressure is um, linear with depth, because in air we know that the density changes as you go up. But this actual expression that <coughs> dz, dp is equal to, this is going to be equal, all I'm doing is this, right? This is 1. So dz is equal to 1, and dp is equal to minus gamma. And it's negative because it increases as you go down. And so, so it's just a, a function of being able to keep a coefficient as a positive coefficient. It's always a positive coefficient, but it just gives you the right uh, big. So this is always true. I guess I've taken a long time in making that point. The consequences of this is that for an incompressible fluid, then we know that the pressure is equal to the pressure at some point plus the unit weight times the height below the surface, not z. h is positive, right? So you can work out whether things would go down or not. And for compressible, uh, because the this coefficient is a function of elevation as well, uh, we had an expression, and the expression we worked out was that the pressure at some point is equal to the pressure at some reference point. Let's call it zero. Actually, let's call this one. Um, multiplied by exponential, and I have to read it here, minus gravity, the difference in elevations between point Z1 and Z0 divided by RT. And remember, it was for an isothermal fluid, so temperature doesn't change. This is 1, pressure at point 1. So and this would be the pressure at point 1 as well, if you want. And this is the elevation change between these two. So that's a consequence of this expression here. And um, you know that if you go um, from one location to another in the same fluid. Oops. I'm getting pretty good at drawing, I have to say, and compliment myself. If you can go from this point here to this point here in the same fluid, and you're at the same elevation because the elevations haven't changed, so you've just gone horizontally only, uh, then if this is 1 and 2, then P1 equals 1, P2. 
And we also said, but not included here, is that the pressures that act in the, at a point are the same magnitude in a static fluid. So Px equals Py equals Pz at a point. So that's um, what we need to take from those expressions we developed. I mean, that's the physical um, attribute of that. <clears throat> the other consequence, I suppose, of this are the manometer equations. So I'm looking at the screen. So if people have questions, then just shout. I thought I had a sort of hand wave. So the manometer equations a direct consequence of this, I suppose. And they are that if you go down, then you add pressure, positive. If you go up, you subtract pressure, negative, minus VE. We went through a whole class once, and then people at the end of the class said, what the hell are you writing this? Mi minus VE. So positive and negative. Um, because of this, that the density of air is about 1 over 1,000 of the density of liquids, most liquids. Water certainly is 1 over 1,000, uh, but all, all liquids. Then um, the density of a gas you can assume is zero usually. And if it's a closed container with only the, the, the volume that's been made by vaporizing the, the liquid, then the, the vapor, the pressure, pressure is equal to the vapor pressure of that liquid. So we went through an example with um, a barometer, mercury, finger over the top, turns upside down. Probably should wear a glove, of course. Uh, and the gap that opens up is at the vapor pressure because the, the, um, the mercury is cavitating. It's failed in tension and changed from being a liquid to being a vapor in that little headspace. And you can use that. Okay. So viscosity. There's one full question on viscosity. There's one full question on fluid pressures. And there's one full question on pressures on structures. And, uh, and failure modes, I guess. So we did one with a, a butterfly valve, like a carburetor valve, but it was a, a bigger, you know, it's 10 meters across or something, that rotates around some axis. And so that's the, the idea of being able to not only fi figure out the forces that are acting, where they act, but be able to look at a failure mode. So I guess I'm going to put failure mode. So, um, magnitude. I guess I should probably draw, but it might be helpful to draw a figure, right? If you, you've seen this perspective figure before, but let's do it anyway. Just So, this is the x-coordinate. This is the surface of the fluid, which the x-coordinate is in. The y coordinate system is inclined. I think I'm going to become an artist, artiste. Okay. And so I'm trying to think, so this should be like A. And the important um, coordinate, as you know, this is y two. Height to the 
And um, the location where the force acts is given by gallon. Serious stuff. The YR is where the resultant force acts. Always true. And then it's going to get crowded if I draw that force, but that force acts at this point. And it's of magnitude FR. And it's always perpendicular to that plate. So hopefully you see what we've drawn here. It's a perspective view of a plate that's below the fluid. There's a coordinate system that's inclined. The plate sits within that coordinate system. The centroid of the plate is the middle point. It's a depth Y from the top. Um, it's a depth HC from the surface. And the point where the force acts is somewhere below the centroid, which is where FR is, is pointing. And so that's kind of what that figure is. And you know from that that the Magnitude of the force that acts is always um, resultant force. Unit weight of the fluid times uh, the area of the plate multiplied by H sub C, the depth of centroid. A is equal to, in this case, B, B times A. So H sub C, so the this is the location of the centroid, which is the, the point in the middle. And this is just its vertical depth. Location where it acts is always given by, I guess you can do it in three different ways. So the first way is that by taking moments, yr is equal to the second moment of area about the centroid divided by the area of the plate and yc, I think, or is it yc squared, yc, <coughs> plus yc. You can write it in a slightly different way. The question last time is why did I write it this way and have it shown somewhat differently. I think it's useful to think of it this. You can also write it um, as a, just a fraction, but writing it this way means that it acts at the centroid plus a small amount. You could think of this as delta yc, right? This 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 length here. Without complicating this figure too much. Would the magnitude equation give it by gauge pressure? It depends. It would give it uh, in. Yes, uh, it gives it, it as a difference between the fluid pressure acting on the surface. So if the fluid pressure acting on the surface, yes, yeah, it just yeah. gives it a difference from the fluid pressure acting on the surface. So if you do define the fluid pressure acting on the surface as 100 kPa and add this to it, then it'd be gauge pressure. If you define the fluid pressure on the surf, no, sorry, it'd be an absolute pressure. If you define it on the surface as zero, then it would be in gauge pressure. It's a difference in pressure. Okay, so this force is given as a difference in pressure at the, the surface. Okay. Sorry? Ixc is uh, by looking at these are values of Ixc. If you need it, you'll be given it, but you could, you might want to know this. You um, can't give too much away. Yeah, you'll be given it. You are going to be given it. You don't need to take that away. And you may well need it, based on what we just said. Okay? You said that you could give those IXC Yes, I did. And I don't lie too much. 
I know you're not in the mood for humor this morning. <laughs> yes, you will be given them. So that's one way to do it, right? So that's one way to get location. Uh, force will always act perpendicular to that plane. Fluid pressures always act perpendicular to a surface. And so you know the orientation of this. We did talk about the resultant forces. So I don't think it's really specific to um, fluid beat forces on structures, but whoops. But we did talk about forces in y and forces in x. That you can always get the resultant if you need it as equal to just Pythagoras. Okay, so there are three ways you can get location. The first one is the one that we just talked about in terms of the coordinates of that particular surface. The second one is to resolve forces. So in other words, if you have a, a plan view of a, uh, sorry, a, a section view of a plate that looks like this, I guess that's not going to do it. section view of a plate that looks like this. This is your plate. You know that the fluid pressures acting on this, if the water surfaces here, are going to be some magnitude of a pressure acting at this point, some magnitude of a larger pressure acting at this point. And what you can do is divide it into these kind of force uh, these pressure distributions and a pressure integrated over an area is equal to a force, right? Just by definition. And so what you can do is if you want to know the location, and we, we talked about this briefly in, in class, is that for this, uh, for instance, the magenta distribution, You know that the resultant force acting on this is this force due to this, which you can calculate. You know that the resultant force acting on the triangular distribution is If this is L, then this is 2 over 3 times L. Bless you. Oops. This is L over 2. And if you want to calculate what where the resultant acts. The resultant has to act somewhere between these two forces, you can imagine, uh, for reasons that will become apparent in a second. So this is total. Actually, let's call it R. And I didn't label this, but I will label this as F triangle. And we did this in class that F triangle times L triangle plus F square times the lever arm of the square has to equal the resultant force times the lever arm of the resultant. And so the lever arm of the resultant in this particular case, if we take it around the top of the distribution, this would be LR. And so from this, we know that the resultant force is equal to the sum of these two other forces, square plus triangle. So if we can calculate this, which we can, just from the distributions, uh, and the distribution of this would give you the force I 
could count it, uh, yes. So it's getting very comp. Yeah, I, I won't do that because it's getting too count. Comp look back at some of our, our previous stuff and you figure it out. Yeah. Say it again. The, Yeah. Okay. Yes. Correct. Yes. So the question is for the force on the triangular part. So this is the area in this plane. And it's multiplied by the length of the plate and multiplied by the width of the plate. And so if you substitute this expression in here, hopefully it gives you the right units. It would be Z2 minus C1, which is a length length of the plate, the width of the plate, multiplied by a half times the unit weight. And so this is units of, I won't write, this is units of meters cubed. This is in units of, this is a half, right? It's probably good use of our time spending time on this. And this is units of newtons per meter cubed. So meters cubed divided by meters cubed gives newtons. So that's the right units. So, so I think this would be a useful thing to, to look at. Okay. So basically what you're doing is you're taking the average pressure that acts uh, the middle of this, multiplying it by one, uh, multiplying it over the area of this plate to get the total amount, and you're taking the difference in pressure, which is this part of the triangle, and then evaluating the area underneath this triangle. And you'll find that's exactly this, and that's where the half comes in. So. And so if you know what those lever arm lengths are, I guess we didn't say that, right? So the, what are the lever arm lengths? around this top. For the square distribution, this is equal to d over 2, sorry, l over 2. And for this, it's equal to 2 thirds l. Just from that. And you can get those from those centroid figures as well. There is a third way to do it, and we didn't really go through that, and I think you don't need this, but you have it just in case. Uh, we talked about using the behavior on a, a plate, and there was an example we showed that had three ways of solving these things for a, a plate with a fluid on top of it, 
where this was inclined at 45 degrees and it was distance one here and distance one here. question is what's the force acting on the plate just like this. And so the way to do that is to basically divide it up into three parts. Three parts is equal to one. same and you can resolve that. I, I, I mentioned that because that's just one way of doing it but you don't have to, to uh, yeah. use one and two. If you use something you'll, you can get both one and two. All right. So that's fluid pressures on structures. Um, I guess what we haven't said is that the other part is failure modes. No, let's talk about, yeah, okay. And I guess two, two important points is that in this case here, we took moments around this point to be able to resolve the, we said that since we can get this, since we can get this and this, and we can also know exactly where these simple prismatic or triangular force distributions act, we know where they act. We took moments around this point here, which was how we got this, this expression. This was just by taking moments. This was basically saying sum of moments are equal to zero. We could also have taken moments around this point here, or we could have taken moments around actually anywhere, anywhere in the universe, as long as we know the, the, direct, the, the physical locations. It just happened to be easiest here. If we want to look at failure modes, and we did a little example that I recall was something like this. With uh, you remember we did something with a gate that whoops that had a hinge in the middle, and we wanted to figure out exactly what the forces were that were acting the magnitude of the resultant, location of the resultant, so I guess this is YR. By the way, YR is always relative to the surface, yes, as we suggested here. It's important that this intersects the surface, and YC is as well. So we could actually solve this problem uh, by looking at the fluid pressure distribution. I won't. So the fluid pressure distribution on this face, we could decompose like this. And we could do exactly what we did uh, previously to figure out where the triangular part acts and where the square part acts. Or we could resolve exactly where it acts. So I guess this is method number one above, and this would be method number two. Importantly, both of these ways of resolving where the force acts are done by noting that the moment of the resultant is equal to the force multiplied by the location of the resultant. That's implicit in these equations we have. The YR equation comes exactly from this, and our um, calculation of what the resultant force from this would be, which we could have, this would be FR. So 
So they come from this expression. But the one important thing is, if you're looking at failure of this, you can't you can get this by taking moments about any point. You can take the point, moments about this point. You could take them about this point. You could take them about this point. That would be fine to figure out what the magnitude of the resultant is. But if you're looking at a failure mode, you absolutely have to look at the moment around the failure mode that you're defining. And so if you're trying to figure out in this case, what force you have to apply here to stop this opening or whatever, um, it would be here, then you have to take moments around this point. Once you've figured out what these forces are, then you have to take moments about this point. And so it's a two-step process. And so this, so it's worthwhile knowing that. So for failure, oops. so either if it's kind of a sliding failure mode, then you have to resolve horizontally or downslope or something. If it's rotational, you need moments about fulcrum. The rotation point, right? In this case, this is the fulcrum. So that's important. Okay, and I suppose uh, the final thing is as part of this. So, part of number three, you said buoyancy is, is part of the deal, and so uh, let's just quickly talk about buoyancy. Again, um, Whatever the shape of the thing is doesn't really matter. It has some volume. And what does matter is that the structure might have some weight to it. And it would also have a buoyant force, Fb. And we know that the buoyant force is equal to the unit weight of the fluid, liquid really, I guess. Uh, yeah, let's use fluid, I guess it could be either. Multiplied by its volume. So this is the displaced volume. And this is the displaced fluid. So the fluid outside here is here. And so actually, you know, just as an aside, we never really pointed this out, but if you look at the resultant forces, the resultant force is equal to the unit weight of the fluid times an area times HC. You think of this as a volume, so for instance, if this was something that had an area A and a height here HC, it's kind of the same equation, but it's just probably complicating matters. You don't need to know that, so if that confuses you, don't write it down. This is gamma fluid and this is volume. Is that the question? I was just going to say that. The buoyant force acts through the center of buoyancy. And so the center of buoyancy is basically the centroid of the displaced volume. So in other words, if you could take this volume that's displaced and put a uniform density in that thing, the point that you could put that on your finger in the middle of that structure, and it would balance exactly, which is the centroid by definition, is the point where that acts. So that's important. Also, 
when you look at centers of gravity, it's the same as the center of gravity of that displaced body. And so that would be where gravity would act if that was, so I'm not sure. So what would that be? So the center of buoyancy for a structure that is a cube would be the axis that goes into here and into here and also from the top. So this is the centroid of that volume. Which is also the center of gravity. is also the center of buoyancy. Okay. Center of gravity based on the mass distribution. So that's it's a mass with a lever arm. Every little piece of mass has a lever attached to it. So that's assuming it's uniform distribution of mass. It's assuming. So in the case of a displaced fluid, it is, right? Because the fluid is displaced. In the case of a structure, I guess it might have different densities at different points, but that's more complicated than you have to deal with here. So, uh, yeah, and so center of gravity means that uh, the weight acts through here. And so if this, so the buoyant force, buoyant force acts upwards, of course. And I guess maybe we should also say that the pressure is acting on something, force acts through center of pressure. In other words, the point that we've given the coordinates of y sub r, below the surface. So in, in previous years, I think what we've done is I've quickly gone through this, and then I've gone through about 20 pages of stuff um, that's culled from the notes that we've gone through so far. Now, if you still want to look through that stuff, maybe last year's probably has that, I'm pretty sure, and certainly years before. So there's, there's all those resources. But I plan to post this. Um, I don't, I mean, we're basically five minutes out of time. Um, I'm happy. Five minutes until we're out of time. I don't think we have a chance to go through that, um, I'll show you what that is just by zipping through it, mm, stuff you've seen before. And so there's a, a narrative that comes with this in some of the previous recordings. And it's all stuff you've seen before, ideal gas law, viscosity, you know you should look at this in some detail. There's an example for viscosity that we went through maybe in week 1-2 or 1-3, I can't remember which one. Surface tension, fluid pressures in, <coughs> in liquids, fluid pressures in gases, uh, constant pressure with depth, manometer equations, forces on structures and resolving uh, moments, etc. Where forces, magnitudes of forces, where they act, centroids, resolving free body diagrams. This is the example I talked about, and buoyancy, and accelerations, of course. Did you guys lose interest already? <laughs> Sorry, say it again. It could do, uh, but we didn't go through it in much detail. The question was, could stability be on there related to buoyancy? If you know stability for the fluid pressures on structure stuff, you'd understand the stuff for that. Question in the back? No. Um, well, center of pressure really acts on a surface, and center of buoyancy can act inside the volume. So they are, they are different. 
and they act at different points as well. Yeah, they are different. Any other questions? So go through 4.2 and 4.3. They're not on the test, but they're for this week. Uh, the deadlines for those for the quizzes are Monday and Wednesday, respectively. Homework due this Thursday. Um, next homework for next week, because there's a test, is due on the Sunday rather than the Thursday. So you can have Thursday, Thursday, guilt-free. Um, test on... Wednesday, split in two rooms. I'll send a, an announcement that'll give locations. We'll split by people's families' names. One is um, Walker, one is the Forum Building. Um, come prepared to stay for as long as you wish. Um, eight till is a 90 minute exam, same as the other ones, but you're welcome to stay for four hours if you so wish. People who have uh, disability chits, uh, you should contact Shengji and he'll contact you to set up somewhere, a quiet place. Look at the